Perhaps the primary distinction of the artist is that he must actively cultivate that state which most men necessarily must avoid, the state of being alone. The state of being alone is not meant to bring to mind merely a rustic musing beside some silver lake. The al aloneness of which I speak is much more like the aloneness of birth or death. It's like the fearless alone that one sees in the eyes of someone who's suffering, whom we cannot help. Or it's like the aloneness of love, the force and mystery that so many have extolled and so many have cursed, but which no one has ever understood or ever really been able to control. James Baldwin. My friend, come every night, I'm terribly lonely. Professor G. N. Sai Baba, under Maximum Security Cell, India, 2017. Those are the words of G. N. Sai Baba, Professor of English and Human Rights Activist. He's on life sentence in India. He's 90% physically disabled. Um, his health now is in a condition of acute deterioration. Um, I received a note from his wife yesterday that he tried to write a letter to me and couldn't. Um, he's a professor at Delhi University, or was a professor at Delhi University, engaged in human rights activism uh, on behalf of vulnerable populations in India. So that includes tribal groups who suffer from poverty and human rights violations. He fights against caste oppression and against abuses by um, corporations, including mining corporations. Uh, in 2014, police arrested him as he left the university campus. And following the arrest, they found documents and correspondence allegedly proving his connections to CPI Maoist movement. And he was convicted and sentenced to life imprisonment under the notorious Unlawful Activities Prevention Act, accused of being a member of a terrorist uh, organization. Um, through his wife, he has sent letters to me. Uh, I think about the physical effort it must have taken him to write those letters with his damaged hand and the honour it is for me to receive them. Um, I'm just going to quickly read you a bit from the last letter that he sent through his wife. So he said to his wife, Asantha, send the following lines to our friend Sophia. Dear Sophia, I received your letter written on the 5th of July 2022. It brought to me the fragrance of your art. I wanted to write a reply immediately, but fell ill seriously. Next two months, I could not focus my attention on anything. It was probably swine flu. All of us got contracted the same virus. Somehow I survived, but my, my co-accused succumbed to the pathogen. I couldn't recover from this tragedy. Pandu Narote was from quote, the most primitive tribes of central India, as such designated by the UN. He did not know what law, court and a case meant until he was implicated in this. I sometimes write to the professor about architecture. Sometimes I send them to him and sometimes I just keep them as phone notes. I wrote, it's the clinical passivity of most structures of our built environment, for one can hardly call them architecture, that terrifies me. A reflection of the passivity of the creators and the society they inhabit. These individuals couldn't tell you about human struggle, passions, the outer limits of existence for love nor money. Nothing of sorrow or mistakes in their art. This should come as no surprise. One must know by now that their principal aim in life is to run away from such things, to remain forever in that interminable gray zone of safety and denial. Their lives are adverts of life. Their buildings are adverts of buildings. So 
and I'm talking about buildings as adverts of buildings. I'm talking about things like this kind of architecture that I was involved in for over 20 years. Um, such bravado, but such cowardice. It's all smoke and mirrors. Um, and what's that smoke and mirrors hiding? It's hiding the unnameable. There's a poet, um, Iranian-American poet called Kaveh Akbar. Uh, and when I see these images and think of the kind of architecture I was involved in, I reminded of a poem he wrote called The Palace, where he wrote, a king governs best in the dark, where you can't see his hands move. He also wrote, there are no good kings, there are only beautiful palaces. So I regret to start this talk with a prediction that many of you will discover sooner or later that you're deeply happy in the world of architecture in the sense of the kind of professional career architecture in, in this world. But um, if and when that happens, I think that that realization, as is so often the case with revelations, may also be a gift. In my case, um, I can remember points at which I'd be rushing down the stairwell, for instance, of an office, say Norman Foster's or other offices I worked at, with a roll of drawings to be sending someplace or another. And it would suddenly hit me in waves while running down the stairs that it wasn't meant to be like this. It doesn't feel right. What is it I'm doing with my life? And I tried alternatives to kind of corporate architecture. I tried avant-garde studios like Peter Eisenman's, but alas, no cure to be found there either. Um, don't misunderstand me, please. I, I mean no disrespect to these studios. Uh, this is nothing personal. Uh, I made brilliant friends at these studios who I'm still in touch with, uh, who I phone up regularly with technical questions, um, design questions. They taught me a craft, they supported my career, and now they show a genuine interest in my work and in my cause, um, and, you know, very engaged with what I do. And I learned a great deal from these places. And I think it must be stated that any language of my own, which I've since forged, or can hope to forge, it must have its origin, after all, in this experience, because it's the only experience that I know. And for you, it may be the only experience you will know when you enter that professional world. So this is really not to do with um, personal judgment. I'm no moral judge. I'm an activist, but I'm not a moral judge. God knows I have my flaws. It's to do with systems of reality that we find ourselves trapped in and systems of power. So after over 20 years of this, I had to ask myself, whose interests have I served and at whose expense? And for all my sins, society wouldn't actually consider this to be one. Quite the opposite. This kind of thing brought me a great deal of status. People didn't want me to give this up. So by 2018, I'd had enough. Um, in a sort of blind leap of faith, I threw away my career with no plan. And what I'm doing and where I'm going, I still couldn't tell you. So having taken this rather reckless decision, this gamble, the first thing I did was I took a plane to Dhaka, Bangladesh to visit my uncle, um, photographer and activist Shahidu Alam, who helped to raise me as a child, whose photographs taught me so much about architecture, um, by which I mean architecture in, in the truest sense of the word. Shahidul, who wrote in his book, My Journey as a Witness, I don't want to be your icon of poverty or a sponge for your guilt. My identity is for me to build in my own image. 
You're welcome to walk beside me, but don't stand in front of me to give me a helping hand. You're blocking the sun. So, you know, he's talking about identity. And as architects, how can you offer the best of yourself to this world if you don't first confront your own identity or grapple with it? Now, the system, of course, isn't interested in giving you room to do that because the system is geared entirely and actually very efficiently uh, for its very different end, which is to make you a servant to its own needs, mainly profit and power, which are things that I suspect not many of you have entered architecture for. Um, Okay, I'm going to just sidestep from the narrative a bit here uh, and I just want to focus for a moment on this photograph by Shohibu. So I think there's quite an emphasis on phenomenology in this department. So uh, the Finnish architect Juhani Palasma, who you may well have read, said the ultimate meaning of architecture is beyond architecture. It directs our consciousness back to the world and to our own sense of self and being. Significant architecture makes us experience ourselves as complete embodied spirit, spiritual beings. In fact, this is the great function of all meaningful art. So um, in books like Eyes of the Skin, Architecture of the Senses, which some of you may have read, Halasma talks about the obsession of the eye above other senses in architecture today, the hegemony of the eye. And this is a condition which has been exacerbated by the rather cancerous spread of highly superficial architectural imagery that we see all around us. Uh, and that includes CGIs and sadly a great deal of architectural photography, which is quite poor compared to what it could be. And so if we compare this slide, for instance, with images that we see in this previous one. So this is the interior of a house in the Chittagong Hill tracts in Bangladesh. So this is a, a photograph to be seen, just as those other images are images for the eye to be seen. But this photograph also engages our other senses. So the boy's eyes are invisible, the mother's eyes are averted, the baby's eyes are shut. All sense of focus is fractured through pinpricks of light, shadow, texture, and you have these incandescent auras of light around the human figures. Um, the space, to me, embodies a sense of longing and emotion and life and death that international star architects seemingly have no conception of when I see their work. There's something so human about this image and it's able to capture, for me, the essence of architecture in a way that those other images don't actually come close to. Um, partly this is assisted by the nature of the architecture itself. Uh, indigenous architecture, I think, often does come closer to the essence of architecture because it's the least corrupted by power. I want to look at this photo as well. They're also by Shohibul. This is a woman who's bidding farewell to her husband, leaving for work in the Middle East from the international airport in Dhaka. Why in my 20 plus year career did I never encounter a single discussion in the office on the issue of migrant labor in the construction industry? Not one. Every day, every hour, we would talk about sustainability, climate change, climate emergency, but never ever touching, consciously avoiding the issue of workers' rights, human labor as if it's even possible to talk about sustainability without talking about those things. And clearly it is possible in our most cynical industry for a building to win five-star awards for sustainability, even when migrant workers have been exploited, injured, abused on site, 
or worse. And when I look at this photo, I could look at their expression for hours between this husband and wife. And to me, this photo tells me more about the invisible workings of our craft than my profession ever dared to reveal, because my profession didn't want me to see it. So again, a king governs best in the dark, where you can't see his hands move. There are no good kings, <coughs> only beautiful palaces. So back to the story. So then comes the phone call. On August 5th, 2018, six months after my visit to Paca, I'm back in London and the phone rings in the night. It's my parents ringing from Paca and they say, your uncle's gone. He did an, Al an interview on Al Jazeera about the student protests and around 30 plainclothes police officers turned up at his flat, he's gone. Next time I see him is on telly, like that. He's limping, being dragged to court, and he shouts out to the press cameras, they beat me, they washed my blood-stained Punjabi and made me wear it again, they denied me legal representation, at which point a police officer's hand is clamped on his mouth, as you can see in this image. Um, my mind has actually blanked out big parts of that time. Um, what one encounters is a mixture of extreme lucidity on the one hand, because adrenaline kicks in for the oncoming fight that you have to fight. And on the other hand, you enter some kind of dream state, I would say, because you realise that you're at the moment when the prospect of losing control over your whole life has suddenly become very real because the forces of naked power are now moving into the house of your soul and they're moving fast and they've ransacked the room where you kept all your memories of your beloved uncle and they're maybe going to stay for a very very long time and that power that I kind of alluded to before these systems of power that we, we operate in, these are the kind of extreme ends of what power looks like when it gets very raw. So he was jailed for 107 days. Um, the campaign for him went global, uh, from students and grassroots activists in Bangladesh at one end to international Nobel laureates and film stars on the other end, and he was released. So this was a turning point, as Ruben said, in uh, my life and my work. So during the days I was really busy sending emails, working with lawyers, uh, journalists, writing to politicians, um, just campaigning, campaigning, campaigning constantly. But during the night I would dream about space, which isn't something I actually expected would happen. My mind began to process things through architecture, and I never anticipated this. Uh, I started to dream about spaces that I'd never seen before. So often they were comprised of mainly colour um, and some other sort of indefinable quality, which I might perhaps say is maybe emotion, I, I would say. And they were strange spaces. They were kind of scaleless, expanding, contracting, expanding, contracting again. And I did wonder, you know, what happens to space when you're blindfolded and confined and you're frightened? Is that what happens to space? So I knew he'd been tortured. I knew he was made to walk up and down stairs, blindfolded with heavy objects on his head. And then, um, as my aunt, his partner, began to be allowed to visit him, I then began to quite consciously construct the prison compound in my head from the kind of fragments that I was hearing about. And part of why I was doing this was it, was, it actually calmed me down. 
to sort of build these things in my head. Um, but it was also partly that I wanted to enter the space and be with him, if only to hold his hand. I, I hated the thought of him being alone. And after he came out, he gave me more details about where he'd been and the, and the spaces themselves. And I built a series of small architectural models. So there were scale one to 20 and one to 50 of fragments of, of the space um, based on his memories and my imagination. Mm, so, okay, 2019 and he's out. By now I'm engaged in activism quite fully <coughs> and I've joined a community of other activists and yeah. Um, and then mass protests break out in India, end of 2019, beginning of 2020, against anti-Muslim citizenship laws. So I begin working with artists and photographers from across South Asia who use art as a means of resistance and solidarity. And this body of work is probably one of the bodies of work I'm most kind of known for, um, but it's done in collaboration with many, many, many other artists. Um, and I also set up at the same time, uh, in parallel, a platform for political art and activism from the region that um, showcases our artists work and also um, campaigns for political prisoners. And on that platform, you won't see much of my work because I mainly show the work of other artists. And for them, the medium of art of dissent is whatever their medium is. So it might be photography, it might be illustration, music, poetry, whatever. But um, for myself, I can only really use, I mean, it was a difficult place for me because I can really only use the medium I know, which is the language that I've been taught, which is architecture. You know, I'm not a painter or a writer or a musician life might have been easier if I was, because these fields have a very strong tradition of the art of descent. So I might say, I, I'll make a painting, and it doesn't matter if no one wants my painting, I can make a painting about it. Or I might write, write a song or a poem, and it doesn't matter if no one wants it. But you can't just make a building about this stuff. And architecture doesn't have a tradition of expression exploring these things and so I didn't really know what to do but just keep moving uh, just taking one step at a time venturing towards a direction which is really in many ways unknown to me and you know my last letter to jail professor Sai Baba which I wrote on New Year's Day and I think his wife only received it yesterday, so almost two months it's been. I wrote, uh, I wrote to him, I have few teachers for this architectural journey on this side. My teachers are you on the other side. And since you are a teacher, I thought I would write to you about this work as a record and for your cosmic guidance. So I'm just going to take you through some of the work I've been doing. Essays on Architecture 1. 
The idea came whilst I was swimming, as so many of my ideas do, when I'm weightless. If architecture is an embodiment of humanity, it must confront the pain of the past and present. Pain's mirror is beauty or pleasure. I seek to bring architecture closer to the human condition. A building can provide shelter, comfort and functionality. It can invoke a sense of liberation and awe, but it can also make us look at ourselves. This time last year, my uncle was in jail. When he shut his eyes, he saw bars. I drew cages. Sai Baba said the colour he dreams of is parakeet green. I put two windows in the southwest corner of the kitchen, low near the floor. Would the light mix to give parakeet green? At which time of day and on which surface would it appear, this colour he dreams of from his cell? While you stand on the other side of the opaque fiberglass window, words fail me as though I've forgotten the language of our love and intimacy. Professor Sai Baba's poem to his wife, Vasantha, written in prison. The under barracks are a cluster of windowless cells within the high security confines of Nagpur Central Jail. To get to most cells from the under entrance, you have to pass through five heavy iron gates. The abiding symbol of hope and despair is the Lao gate, the red exit gate. It reappears in your rhetoric, small talk, jokes, and of course in your dreams. It's the barrier that holds you in and the opening that will lead you out. The secret is to ignore the barricade and only see the door. From the prison diaries of Aaron Ferreira, one of the BK-16. So these are kind of real projects I'm working on where some of this starts to come in. And I think I'd say also that the politics doesn't enter or I don't contrive to let it enter my work in any literal way. I think, you know, when I start designing, I still think in terms of architecture first and foremost. I don't think, oh, I'm going to put a red window because Aaron Ferreira talked about red, or I'm going to put a green thing because it's like, oh, it doesn't really work that way. It just comes in however it comes. And the first thing that I think I have to, for me, the first thing I focus on is my craft. And I just trust that the politics will come in, in, in or not, maybe, or uh, maybe other things from my life will come in, other things that are upsetting me or important to me or obsessing me. Um, and that's the way I work. My life is strewn across prison, police courts, false media propaganda, and stinking corridors of hospitals. A thousand days and nights of howls of suffering. The pain kills me, but I still refuse to die. I wonder what you must be doing lonely at this hour in our garden of love.
And quite early on, this is quite soon after Shiny Bill's release, um, I began a body of work called Lita's House. Uh, it was sparked by a one minute piano piece that a friend of mine had written called At Lita's. And Lita's house was a kind of imaginary house I began to conceive. Um, a mirror world of fascism and authoritarianism where I imagined the kind of students, activists, poets, artists, journalists who I was campaigning for would reside. And re but really it was an exercise in drawing. So again, it was for me more where I didn't really think about those things consciously, but more thought about the act of drawing and those things would come in however they came. My face shines under the flames of my burning pain in the dark entrails of the prison house of tyranny. In Lita's house stood a structure, and the structure was the gallows, built of universal beams, but the beams were not of recognisable units. They followed a different scale of measurement, metry, the geometry of death. Don't shut the window of your dreams. I'm coming to see you like a whirlwind. So that's Vasantha, the wife of Sai Baba. She, she can't see him in real life. So she asks him to not shut the window of his dreams. It's the only way she can see him. My love, life of my life, these days I think about death, I mean about life. Shahidul would track the constellations from his cell, the great bear. In the Andani cell, the bodies are knotted, groin to groin, in scissor formation. I rarely have a plan. I'll be cooking the kids' eggs for breakfast. The form of the egg will get lodged in my mind. Later, scraping shells off the plate, my interest is aroused once more. I seize it, draw an egg obsessively, in section, plan, elevation, from multiple perspectives. The fact that the 3D surface of an egg, unrolled into a 2D plane, looks like two spiral staircases winding into infinity, preoccupies me for weeks. No one else shares my excitement. Din is the word for egg in Bangla. I make a new word, din spool, noun. A three or more dimensional space, volume, object or entity unrolled into a 2D planar surface. I sense that one day this word will come back into my work, but I don't know how. Three years later, Professor Sai Baba and Del Gunde are confined in the notorious under circle high security cell. I ask audiences in Germany to sign letters calling for their release. What does under mean? It means egg. Father Stan Swami and the BK-16. My friend asked me to draw a small summer room for her garden. 
I was campaigning for the VK16 prisoners at the time. The walls had texts from the medical bail hearing with 84-year-old Jesuit priest and tribal activist Father San Swami. A few weeks later, he died in custody. VK16 became 15. The Under Egg Barracks are a cluster of windowless cells within the high security confines of Nagpur Central Jail. Each cell carefully isolated from the other. There's little light in the cells and you can't see any trees. You can't even see the sky. From the top of the central watchtower, the yard resembles an enormous airtight concrete egg. But there's a vital difference. It's impossible to break it open. Rather, it's designed to make inmates crack. Prisoner Aaron Ferreira. Gautam Navlaka spent 16 hours alone daily in Amla cell. Ferreira said they piss into a hole. The under high security cell is reported to be 10 foot wide, 31 foot deep, 30 foot high. Unusual proportions, thin. My chapel, my mausoleum, my thin place. A small door to enter, you have to stoop. In under, the guards do not belittle themselves by passing through this door. They enter through a different gate, held head held high. So there's this small door here, which is the height that a child could fit through or someone in a wheelchair could fit through without stooping, but a kind of average adult human would have to stoop to <coughs> enter. And on the other side, there's a very tall red door. Once Faraj had to be carried back to his cell on a blanket. On the way, he had a vision of Malik bin Ari when it was his time to die. I felt similarities between him and me. I didn't fear death, I was only sad. He composed this verse. I wasn't alive and I wasn't dead, so I made my way for him. Oh, how the narrowness of this place shames me. the thin place. In August 2021, I visit the island of Iona, Scotland. It's known as a thin place where the boundary between the physical world and spiritual world is said to be thin. I cycle to the chapel every morning and light candles for the BK-16 prisoners. Father Stan Swami is gone brave and truthful witness whose life has in effect been taken by agents of the state. Be sure of my prayers and thoughts and solidarity with all meeting today and with all who continue Father Stan's work for justice and shared human dignity. Rowan Williams, former Archbishop of Canterbury. I sent Professor Anand Delgunde one of the BK-16 prisoners, drawings from Iona, and wrote to him about the thin place, saying, Sometimes I wonder if drawings are thin places. Perhaps that's why I send you drawings, as a means to escape into the image and enter another world. A world on the other side of this planet, or a world even beyond this, where Father Stan resides. I don't know. He wrote back, Dear Sophia, received your lovely drawings of Iona Abbey, many thanks. Indeed, drawings are thin places. They metamorphose physical objects 
into spiritual things that communicate beyond words. I did an exhibition in Germany. Over 800 visitors signed letters calling for Dr. Del Bunde's release. In November 2022, he was released. I wrote, Dear Anand, you're released from prison. I see you in this photograph at home holding the book of letters. Now art, that curious, intangible thing whose purpose so many have questioned, speaks back to me from a place beyond logic or definition. I will carry the feeling to the end of this life and beyond. Hugs to you and those still inside from me at the thin place. Um, I'm just going to show a quick video and that's the end. Thanks. <laughs>